Hello, my name is Giuliano, and today I'm going to talk about the formal verification of the Stellar Consensus Protocol. So the Stellar Consensus Protocol, uh, abbreviated SCP for short, is at the core of the Stellar network. So nodes running SCP independently propose uh, new blocks, and they try to decide on a unique new block to append to the blockchain. Now, the Stellar network is a permissionless network. This means that anybody can join or leave the network at, at any time without asking permission to anyone. Because of that, SCP must tolerate malicious participant and also civil attacks in which an attacker creates a huge number uh, of fake malicious participants to try to overwhelm the network. So the goal of this work is to verify SCP's correctness for uh, arbitrary configuration. This means an arbitrary number of participants uh, with each participant having an arbitrary configuration. Uh, we want to do this because we cannot predict in advance how many nodes will join the system and how they will be configured. So here, by correctness, we mean two main uh, properties. First, no two good nodes should ever disagree on the next block to append to the blockchain, which is a safety property. Second, assuming that we have a variant of eventual synchrony, then every good node must eventually decide a new block to append to the blockchain. And this is a liveness property. So note that even for a fixed but arbitrary configuration, the state space of the protocol is infinite. So this is a hard verification uh, problem, but we could think that luckily you know, we, we now have those powerful SMT solvers uh, at hand, which, which will help us a lot. So unfortunately, let leave uh, protocol verification is hard even with uh, automated solvers. And to illustrate why, I will quote uh, the paper that you see on the screen, published in 2017 at, at SOSP. So the authors were using SMT solvers uh, to perform some verification tasks, and they noted the following. They said, the most frustrating recurring problem was proof instability. Timeouts are challenging to debug because the solver generally fails to provide useful feedback. Even once fixed, the proof may easily time out again due to minor perturbations. Worse, minor changes can trigger timeouts in seemingly unrelated proofs. So here we see that the, the problem is that even though SMT solvers can sometimes find proofs automatically for very complex statements, they don't do so predictably. And because of that, their deductive power does not translate to verification productivity. All right, so for productive uh, verification, what we need is automation that is predictable, stable, and transparent. So by predictable, we mean that it's possible to decompose the proof into a set of lemmas such that for each lemma, we can reason reasonably predict uh, how the solver uh, will perform on this lemma. Second, it should be stable, uh, meaning that if we make small irrelevant changes to our protocol, this will not greatly impact solver performance. And third, it needs to be transparent, meaning that if for some reason the solver is not able to analyze a lemma, it doesn't just time out or run out of memory, but it provides a useful explanation as to why it was not able to analyze the lemma, and then the user can use this information to restructure the proof and make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, so uh, because of those observations, we choose for a verification of SCP to use the IV prover which enables productive use of the Z3 uh, automated solver through decidable logics. So there are three main hypotheses behind uh, IV. The first one, which we just covered, is that predictability, stability, and transparency will increase uh, verification productivity. The second one is that those three properties can be achieved by restricting ourselves to using only decidable logics when we do verification. And the third hypothesis is that by using tools and uh, strategies implemented in Ivy, we can actually reduce the verification of complex protocols like SCP to 
a set of decidable verification conditions. In the case of SCP, those hypotheses were verified in practice. In fact, to verify SCP with IV, it took the following, about 150 lines of uh, specification, specify the protocol, about a dozen invariants to prove the safety property of uh, SCP, which is that no two nodes ever disagree on the next block. And uh, to prove the liveness property, it took about 50 invariants. So this proof was a little uh, trickier and it took about a month of uh, full-time work to uh, formalize uh, in IV once uh, we understood the, the, the protocol and the liveness property properly. So I will now demonstrate how protocol verification works in IV using a simple example, the toy agreement protocol. So here we have a set of nodes communicating by message passing and like in consensus, each node proposes a value and all nodes must decide on a unique proposal. The protocol is very simple. Every node broadcasts its proposal to everyone and a node decides on a value when this value has been proposed unanimously by a strict majority. We suppose that nodes do not deviate from the protocol here. So you can see that this uh, protocol will ensure that at most one value will be decided uh, because two st strict majorities must uh, have a node in common and therefore we cannot have two strict majorities that voted for two different values because that would mean that the node in common voted uh, proposed sorry twice which cannot happen here this is so this is a safety property no two nodes decide on a different uh, value now this protocol is not very live because if every node proposes something different then there will be no uh, no decision here but we should be able to prove that if message delivery is reliable and from the beginning a strict majority proposes the same value then all nodes eventually decide so we're now going to see how to prove those two properties so first we have to specify the uh, domain model of our protocol in EPR, which is a decidable fragment of first order logic. So EPR is uh, nice because it's decidable, but it also has limited expressivity. So it's like first order logic where we can use uh, propositional logic uh, connectives or and implication not and so on, and the universal and existential quantifiers. And we can also declare sorts, constant symbols, relation symbols, and function symbols. Quantifiers must range over individuals, so we cannot quantify over relations or uh, functions. And there are no built-in theories, no arithmetic, no bit vectors or arrays and, and so on. So it's fairly restricted. Moreover, for a formula to be an EPR, we can only use stratified quantifier alternations and uh, functions. So I'm not going to explain here what uh, this means, but you can check our paper for, for the details. So how do we model uh, the protocol uh, in, uh, in EPR? Well, we cannot use cardinality to define uh, majorities, but we can observe that in fact, that the protocol doesn't really depend on cardinality. It only depends on the fact that two strict majorities intersect. So we're going to abstract over uh, cardinalities uh, in the following way. So we define three types, node, value, and quorum. And quorum, uh, the elements of type quorum will uh, represent uh, majority sets and so since they're sets we also declare a relation member to denote uh, a set membership and crucially we give the axiom that uh, for any two quorum uh, there is a node uh, that they have in common now that we have the domain model we can go to uh, specifying our protocol using IV's procedural language so here on the bottom left uh, we declare the protocol states which consists of three relations, which track which values have been proposed by whom, which decisions have been made and by whom, and which messages have been received by whom from whom. In the initial state, all those uh, relations are empty. And now the protocol evolves according to the following two steps or actions. So in the first action, propose, the node N proposes value V. And as a precondition, it must be the case that the node has never proposed anything yet. And then we reflect that the proposal is made by updating the proposal relation with a tuple NV. In the second action, receive. This is a node N receiving the proposal V from node M. This can happen uh, only if 
node M actually proposed a value V. This is the assume line. And then we update the received relation to reflect that uh, the proposal has been received from M. And now if there is a quorum such that node N has uh, unanimously received proposal V from all the members of uh, the quorum, then node N decides uh, V and we update the decision relation to reflect this fact. So here uh, we're lucky that the transition relation uh, of those two actions here can be expressed as an EPR formula. Finally, we express the agreement property that says that two decisions must always be for the same value. Now that we have uh, specified our protocol, how do we prove the agreement uh, property? Well, we use uh, inductive invariance. So an inductive invariant I is a state uh, predicate that holds in the uh, initial state and that is preserved by every step of the protocol. So by induction, if I is an inductive invariant, then uh, all reachable states of the protocol satisfy I. So if we want to prove that a particular property P holds, then what we do in IV is that we provide an inductive invariant I that implies P. At this point, IV will automatically check whether the invariant we provide is indeed an inductive invariant that implies the property. So in the case of the agreement protocol here, the inductive invariant consists of the three invariants you see uh, here. And uh, we're lucky that those invariants are uh, in EPR, and so IV automatically checks them, and we have completed the, the safety proof. So we might not be always uh, that lucky. Uh, sometimes the invariants, uh, checking the invariants will produce non-EPR verification conditions. And in this case, uh, we follow the more uh, general IV workflow that you see here. So starting from our uh, specification and the candidate invariance, uh, IV's verification condition generator generates uh, first order formulas that, that encode the validity of the invariance. And then IV's fragment checker checks whether all the, the verification conditions are decidable. If not, IV stops there and produces an error and uh, um, produces an explanation about, uh, for why the verification conditions are not um, decidable. And then the user can use this explanation to modify uh, their model and try again. If the verification conditions are decidable, then IV sends them to Z3 for analysis. And these three will answer either yes, uh, everything's fine, or no, and here is a counterexample. Uh, because we only send decidable uh, EPR verification conditions to Z3, uh, in practice, these three always answers yes or no, never runs out of memory or times out. So the crucial thing to note here in this workflow is that every step produces a reliable, uh, reliably produces an informative uh, output. We now turn to proving liveness of our toy agreement protocol. So first we specify the liveness property that we want to prove using linear temporal logic. This is what you see on the screen here. So essentially, we assume that there is a quorum Q and a value V, such that the quorum Q eventually unanimously proposes uh, V and never proposes anything else. And then we also assume that uh, message delivery is reliable, meaning that if a proposal uh, is sent by a node, then eventually it's received by uh, every node. And under those assumptions, we uh, we want to show that eventually every node decides our value little v. Now here there is a little additional trick. So we are going to do this proof by contradiction. So we're going to assume that there exists a node that never decides the, the value little v. And to ease the proof and eliminate the quantifier, we're going to add here uh, the fact that if there exists a node that never decides v, then it must be this particular node little n that we declared above. But this is sound uh, as long as n uh, is a fresh uh, constant. All right, so now that we have specified the uh, liveness property, how do we prove it? Well, surprisingly, we're going to use an inductive invariant, like for safety. This is based on the following principle. Proving that a transition system uh, satisfies a linear temporal logic uh, formula is equivalent to checking the emptiness of a corresponding uh, Bushy automaton. So emptiness of a Bushy automaton means that the automaton has no 
infinite uh, executions. So in a finite state system, like our toy consensus uh, system, uh, this reduces to proving that there is no lasso in the system visiting every fairness condition. This is because in a finite state system, uh, if uh, the system never visits the same state twice, then there cannot be any infinite execution because at some point you run out of states to visit and you have to stop. No lasso is a safety property that uh, we can then verify with uh, IV as we did before. If the system is not a finite state system, like uh, SCP for example, then there we can use uh, a finite abstraction and uh, apply the same uh, reasoning. So what will happen in, in IBIM is that for verifying licenseless property, well, we start on the left with our transition system and our LTL property to check. And then IBIM's liveness to safety reduction tactic will automatically produce a new transition system and a new safety uh, property where the new transition system uh, contains the Gucci automaton that we talked about. The new safety property is that we cannot uh, visit the same state twice if we uh, visit all the fairness conditions. And now we have to provide an inductive invariant proving the new safety property. And then uh, we can apply the same method as for uh, safety verification. So in the case of the uh, toy agreement uh, protocol, we provide the uh, following invariant that you see here uh, on the screen. And uh, one thing that is noteworthy is that this invariant also talks about the state of the Bushi automaton, which is automatically generated by IV. And you can see this by the weird symbols that appear that we never declared before. For example, L2SD and L2SW are part of the transition system that is generated by, uh, by IV. All right, so in here we're uh, we're lucky again because this uh, checking that this is an inductive invariant produces only verification conditions that are decidable in EPR, and uh, IV can automatically verify this, and we have our proof. So in general, the system might not be finite state, and uh, in fact, uh, SCP is not finite state. So in this case, if the system has infinitely many states, then we use uh, a form of finite abstraction uh, with techniques that are described in the following two papers that you see on the slides. This concludes my talk. I encourage you to read our paper to see the details of how this is applied to the Stellar Consensus Protocol. Thanks for watching.